introduction, my name is Rabbi Yaakov Lyons, also go by Rabbi J. Lyons. I'm, uh, I live in Boca Raton, Florida, and uh, I work for the National Association of Chavar Kedisha. So the National Association of Chavar Kedisha, we have our information over there on that table, you can take stuff on your way out. Uh, we do everything from starting Chavar Kedisha to uh, training Chavar Kedisha to dealing with uh, issues of end of life issues, uh, medical directives, halakhic living wills, uh, all that type of thing. We uh, have a Nichum Avelim program uh, for Shiva houses. We are in the midst of working on a, uh, a program for mourners, booklets that would be readily available in hospitals and hospices and uh, funeral homes, etc. That would be more for the general. Crowd, Jews of, of all backgrounds, and uh, and basically all matters, uh, all matters covered with Kedisha, uh, you know, we deal with. Um, there are, uh, there's, we're not, just so you know what we're not, we're not sort of an organization that says, here are the standards, here are the mask standards, and, you know, and you either like, you know, you follow them and you have your certi certification, or you you don't in your, you know, chutz it's not like that. There are many Chavrus Kedisha that have different minhagim. There are certain things in the Tahara process that are not a matter of a minhag from this city or a minhag from that uh, community. Thank you, thank you, right? Okay, there were customs. There are different customs during the Tahara practice, so like, um, just in the way that we put on the shrouds, uh, if you would go to uh, you know, to even where I'm from in Palm Beach County. So there's uh, the Volker Town Synagogue has a Chaver uh, Kedisha, and uh, and there's a, there's a Chabad Chaver Kedisha, which is the Chaver Kedisha Palm Beach County. Slight differences between the two, you know, as far as different customs. Oh, that's great. There are other things that are not necessarily a matter of a custom that would vary from Chaver Kedisha to Chaver Kedisha, but rather a matter of in the Tahara process, to do it this way is more efficient. And that's where we come in. Um, and, you know, we try to help and to train and whatnot. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, everything from a, a Sephardic Chavar Kedisha to a, uh, you know, Lithuish, as they say, you know, Lithuanian-based Chavar Kedisha to a Chabad Chavar Kedisha, all of them are very much within the, uh, the, the, the broad tent of the National Association of Chavar Kedisha. So, with that introduction, what we're going to talk about today is actually going to be probably 95% uh, just to understand why we do what we do. What's so important about the work of the Chavar Kedisha, and, and then, uh, like, you know, like Mr. Forsman said, to kind of, on a practical level, hopefully you'll all be really inspired and convinced, uh, and, uh, and we'll talk about where we're going to go as a community, uh, you know, what the next steps are. Uh, by raise of hands, who has the Dahi Tahara before? Excellent. Okay, looks like we have more training to do with the uh, lady side, but that's fine. Um, okay, so uh, so just to get started, to go to the very, very, very basics, very basics, we have, we're going to start at the beginning, <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. Uh, so it says, so God said, let us make man in our image, like our form. Who's God talking to? He's talking to the angels. Very confusing, the whole our business, which we're about to discuss. So God created man in his image, uh, and they created male and female. Okay, so the, uh, the Svarno, the great commentary of the Svarno says, he's bothered by this whole our image business, because, uh, you know, the idea, if you just think about it, for, for God to say to the angels, let's do anything, you know, our anything, right, you know, plural, inclusive, you know, God is supreme, God is lofty, right? And, and so to include the angels with God in the same, uh, you know, the same pronoun, how does that work? So the Sforno says, and our image means as follows, that as far as our actions, our actions now, right, people, we are in a sense angelic in that the angels perform deliberate, thought-out actions. So we as people, just the human, human, humankind, are loftier than animals in the sense that we can do a deliberate action. And in that sense, we're like angels. However, angels act without free will. And in that sense, we're not like angels. In a small way, man is like God. We're like Hashem, in, who acts with free will. However, however, 
Hashem's, right, God's will is always the best, which is not the case with us, because the truth is that we don't always do the right thing. Uh, so, in that sense, God's will is much loftier uh, than the free will of man. So, therefore, it says, like our form, resembling our form, but not truly our form. So, in other words, not truly godly, but we are godly. And we're angelic. And we're amazing. And this is when we speak in terms of, the, of man being created in the image of God, what we mean is that we have the ability to choose right from wrong, and in general, that we're loftier than the animals in the sense that we have, you can just basically we can do you know, deliberate thought out actions, and that we're godly in the sense that we can do the right thing. We don't always choose to do the right thing, but we have the ability to do the right thing. It's that potential. And, uh, and that's, that's our starting point. So moving on from there, image of God. Okay, so what does that mean, the image of God? It means that we have the free will to choose to act in a godly or ungodly way. And, and there you have, this is going to become very important in the sense that we're going to, when you compare like a, a really great, righteous, godly person to the type of person who you wanted to ask them to watch your bag at the airport for a minute, right? So the truth is that both of those people are godly in the sense that they have the free will. Both of those people are created in the image of God in the sense that they have the ability to choose to do the right thing. One of them often does. The other one often does not. But, the, but that distinction is not necessarily what we're going to focus on. Okay, moving on with that introduction. So Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 23. This is the mitzvah of burial. And the, the, the idea that there's a mitzvah of burial is a very important thing because in the, in the world out there, there is a term which we should never use, which is the, the way that people dispose of their dead. Okay? We, as Jews, do not dispose of our dead. We don't bury them because it's a uh, natural way of disposing of them, or it's a convenient way of disposing of them, or whatever it is. There's no, we, we do not do it because we are disposing of our dead. What we do is that we do the mitzvah in the Torah, hold on, I'm getting there, sorry, I had the mitzvah in the Torah of burying the dead. So the same way that when a baby is born, baby boy is born, there's a mitzvah to give him a bris, the same way that when a man and a woman are ready to have a family together, there is a mitzvah of going to the chuppah and having a Jewish marriage. The same way that on Passover there is a mitzvah of having a seder, and so on and so forth. When right when when one of our brethren dies, there is a mitzvah to bury them. And here it is. It says, "Don't let his body stay overnight on the tree." We're going to talk about the tree in a minute here. But rather, you should definitely bury him that day, for the humiliation of Hashem is. Hanging. And here we have this Tovah Salotim, right? This humiliation of Hashem. So, how did God get into this scenario? So, Rashi says this whole humiliation of Hashem hanging is that it is an indignity to the king since man was fashioned in his image. Right? So, because we were made in the image of God and the Jewish people are his children, it's comparable to identical twin brothers. One became a king. The other became a bandit. When the criminal was caught and hanged, the passerby says that the king is hanging. So they're identical. Right? So that's not exactly the case because when we speak in terms of being made in, in the image of God, we don't mean that God has two eyes or that God has a nose or that God walks on two feet or, or anything like that. What we mean by the image of God is that we can act in a godly way. But the idea is that here you have a person who passed away and people say, oh my goodness, such a godly creature, man. Loftier than the angels, right? It is in a in a in a situation of uh, of humiliation because the, the the soul and the body are now departed from each other. So, um, which means that if we focus for a moment on who are we honoring by performing the mitzvah of Jewish burial and all the customs leading up to the burial and whatnot, so who, who are we honoring? We're honoring Hashem. We're honoring God because we're all godly people, and that and there's that that godly part of us. We are honoring the soul of the deceased, which we're going to focus on in a moment. We are honoring this concept of being created in the image of God, which means to say that really we are honoring everyone. And in truth, there's, you know, you can 
kind of look at it from a global cultural point of view, that uh, you know that, that, that anyone who would point out that civil societies, decent societies, all you know treat their their dead in an honorable way. But the truth of the matter is that if there's a sort of reverence for the for the soul and for the body, then the truth of the matter is that there's a reverence for everybody alive, those who have passed on, everyone. So it's a you know societal thing. But everyone, this is another important point, which is that everyone, no matter how they live their lives, had the ability to choose right from wrong. And that ability is the image of God. That's what makes us loftier than the angels, and it is the inalienable dignity of every Jew. And this becomes an important point, which we're going to get to, but it becomes a very important point in a situation where Let's say you're in, I don't know, South West Florida, and you have a few wonderful synagogues spread out, but most of the people, uh, you know, who, let's say, are, most people who are passing away at the Jewish funeral home, who don't know about the Chavar Kedisha, who don't know to ask for the Chavar Kedisha, who the funeral directors don't know to send them to the Chavar Kedisha, right? So you could say, well, those people, you know, they, they didn't necessarily, uh, they, didn't, they didn't care to learn, and they didn't really, you know, uh, do anything Jewish while they were alive. So what? So what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who they are. A person could even be a criminal. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, you could even get somebody who's actually a really bad guy. And the truth of the matter is that we as the Chavar Kedisha would give them the same honor as we would anybody else because everyone, no matter how they actually live their lives, has that godly soul that they have the ability to have the ability to choose right from wrong, and and that's what we're honoring. So, in a in in a community where everybody it's just unbelievable, one person after the next are the nicest, holiest people in the world. That community needs a chaver kedisha, and in a community where people don't even know to ask for the chaver kedisha, that community also needs a chaver kedisha just as much. Yeah, the verse before, just so you know, the, the, the mystery in the Torah, like we said, it was uh, Deuteronomy 21, 22, uh, 23, I mean, Deuteronomy 21, 22 is uh, the verse before it. If a man is guilty of a capital sin and is executed, so that you should hang him. Now, just not to get too much into exactly how capital punishment works in the, uh, with the Jewish court, but um, it wasn't actually hung, it wasn't killed by hanging, it was a hanging afterwards. But, um, but the point is, that the mitzvah in the Torah to bury, the mitzvah in the Torah to bury, we're going to go through other verses, we're going to go through verses in the book of Job, we're going to go through verses in Ecclesiastes, very inspirational. In the Torah, the mitzvah in the Torah to bury is actually talking about a criminal. You're not going to get any worse than the guy who we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who is guilty of a capital crime. The Talmud teaches us that if, if, the, if the Jewish court actually executed somebody once every 70 years, and some say once every 49 years, they were an overzealous court. It almost never happens in the Jewish community that you have somebody who's actually guilty of a capital crime. And Hashem is telling us, that guy, right, that one out of 49 years, that guy was actually guilty of a capital crime, and is actually executed, is deserving of honor. He needs to be buried expeditiously because the image of God is hanging there. The, the humiliation of God is, right? Hashem himself is humiliated by this person's humiliation. So you're not going to get any worse than that, and, uh, right? and anybody else obviously is, uh, is, is deserving of, uh, of our honor. Okay, so lesson number one with Kevin Kedisha business is that we are not honoring the person's actions, nor their accomplishment, nor their status in the community. There was one time where I ended up doing what we'll call a celebrity har, okay? We'll call it a celebrity har, and uh, and and it was a, it was an amazing experience because it was a name. If I tell you the person's last name, I forget the person's name. If I tell you the last name, everybody knows the last name. And and he had a tar like everybody else, and he was put in shrouds like everybody else, and he was put into a wooden cask like everybody else, and he was buried like everybody else. And as far as the judgment of the soul, that's for him to judge. We're not going to judge that. But the bottom line is that in the status of the community, you can have somebody that everyone in America will know their last name. And you can have somebody that nobody knew. And, and the neighbors found him. And he really lived a very you know, humble life. The bottom line is that everybody has the same honor 
honor to give to them, and it's a tremendous honor. It's a tremendous honor that we give to them. Um, right, and the reason is, of course, right, because we're honoring the Tzalem Elohim, and therefore we treat everyone identically. This is also an issue that we're, which we spoke about beforehand, Mr. Warshner and I, that there's, it is important, which we'll talk about more when we do perfect union training, it's important, sometimes we'll have people from different communities, oh, my perfect union did it this way, my perfect union did it that way, or, or um, you know, even, even here, you might end up having funeral homes that are very far apart from each other, so you might sort of have like a northern group and a southern group, and they don't necessarily work together so often, you know, just don't have the opportunity. It's important that this Kavrakadisha, Kavrakadisha in this city, in this community, whichever community it is, that they do every Tahara the same way. Because if they start doing things differently, you lose out on the idea that we treat everybody the same. Because we don't treat everybody the same because it's sort of, you know, the hotspot is over there, they kind of do it their own way, so then you lose that whole thing. Not to mention the fact that there's an inefficiency in not having a team work as a team. Um, but uh, but it's a, it's an, I'm just kind of touching on the detail of Focus on it more when we do uh, actual Tahara training, but it's a uh, it's an important, important lesson. Okay. Any questions so far before we talk about the, the soul experience? Okay. The the soul. So what happens to the, to the body? What happens to the body? What happens? What happens to the soul after we die? So we have a little insight from the book of Eo, the book of Job, uh, chapter nineteen. Verse 26, Ba'athar Ori Nikvuzos, after my skin, this is all peeled away, Umibasari Achazelaka, and without my flesh, I will see Hashem. The existence that we have, we speak, we think in terms of perception through sensory perception. In other words, we, we see things, we touch things, we, we hear things, we smell things, right? Really, we have an ability to sense things that are way beyond the, the sense organs. And furthermore, people sometimes talk about having like sixth, how do I say that sixth sense, right, of things, right, that they kind of like, you get a feeling about that guy, you know, you spoke to, you know, you, you tell a friend, you know, that, you know, you, you don't get a good vibe, you know, something like that, or maybe you get a great vibe, you know, certain things like that. Um, there was an experience that we had, this is my, my grandfather uh, passed away in St. Louis in 2012. And uh, shortly before that, a few months before that, he was not doing well. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, he was suffering from dementia, it was very well, you know, progressed. But the truth of the matter is that we had two, we had, we had, at the time, we had two children that he had never met, and I had seen him, we were down here in St. Louis. So we were going, and my parents were like, Kids aren't ready for this, they're young, they said, Don't worry about it, we got it all planned out. And you know, we went there, and he was more animated, my grandfather was more animated than he had ever been. And he couldn't talk, you know, he still couldn't talk and say anything, but he was very much present in the room without being able to communicate. And the reality is that there's a soul. And um, I mean, in the sense of the rooms were also working, but there's a, you know, there is a, there's a soul there. And it's beyond even the brain function. It's that, that there's a soul and that there's a knowledge that exists with the soul. So when you peel away the filters of the body, what you end up with is that it's not that there's a soul which is lofty and it's in some type of gates of heaven thing or something like that and very far away and removed. That the soul is still able to perceive. If you want a little bit, there's a Angelus Huxley, who I don't love quoting, but I do kind of like this quote. There's something called the doors of perception. If you know the backstory, please do not share it in public. The, uh, I can tell you afterwards, though, if you want to ask me. Anyways, but he has this whole idea. He's quoting this, uh, this Dr. C.D. Broad, who I really tried to research, and I can't track down who he is. But every person is capable of remembering everything, everything that happened to them. We're able to perceive everything that surrounds us. But all that information poured in at once would overwhelm us. So the function of the brain and the nervous system is to protect us and prevent us from being overwhelmed and confused by the vast amounts of information that it pines upon us in our sense organs. In other words, your ears are not there for you to, to sense sound. Your ears are there to block sound. Right? Your eyes are not there for you to sense light. Your eyes are there for you, for you to block light. It's too much. There's too much information that would come in. This is 
is just theory, take it for what it's worth. I'm not signing off on this, okay? But, uh, but it does kind of give a little bit more of a, uh, let's say, uh, natural, uh, almost scientific way of, of approaching it. But even without this, right, just back even without this, the idea of it is that the soul on its own is capable of, of perceiving so much more than our sense organs allow us to perceive. So the most aware person in the room, I have a politically incorrect joke, very politically incorrect. My wife hates it when I tell it, but I get away with it because my last name is Lyons. Now, I'm not Irish, but uh, the person in Ellis Island uh, who was working in the council when my great-grandfather uh, came up to him was Irish, and he gave him a nice, nice Irish name like Lyons. So pretend for a moment that I'm Irish and it's not so bad. There's a joke, that was a very good introduction to my politically incorrect joke. So the joke is, What's the difference between an Irish wedding and an Irish funeral? One less Irishman? One, one less. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. You're almost there. One less? One less drunk guy. Okay, very good. All right. So, excellent. So the, um, so the reason why I like the joke is because the most sober person in the room at, at the funeral, not, not the body, but the soul of that person is really the most aware, most cognizant, most sober person in the room because that neshama, that soul, is perceiving things in a way that no one else in the room is able to perceive them. So, uh, so right, I do use the word filters there. Um, okay, but keenly attuned to what's going on around them even after we've, uh, we've passed on. So that's a very important point because of the next verse, which is, we'll remember our bodies. Yeah, I have this uh, cartoon. So the cartoon is a little bit, but basically you have this guy, right, you know, popular guy with everybody. These two guys are kind of jealous of him, and he says, all he ever talks about is his bloody autopsy. Okay, but anyways, but the idea is, right, the idea is that it's all these souls, after they die, are aware of what, what's going on with the body. That's the joke. Okay, moving on. In all, in all reality, in the book of Job, in the book of Eo, a little bit earlier in the book, in uh, chapter 14, uh, verse 22. So it says, Ach b'soro alav yichav, that his flesh pains him, v'nafsho alav tevala, and his soul mourns over him. It's an amazing idea. It's an amazing, amazing idea. And this is also like when people, you know, like you talk about being buried in a Jewish cemetery, or you talk about having a Jewish, Jewish section in the cemetery, or you, or you talk, talk about, about the idea of people, people being buried with their ancestors, or who they're buried next to, or all these different customs about why we care who they're buried next to. And a lot of it has to do with this, not to mention everything that we do in our practice has to do with this, which is that it's not, it's also not that the soul is far away and doesn't know what's going on with the body, that the soul is actually aware of what's going on with the body, and the soul is mournful of the body. Now, if you think about it, it makes all the sense in the world, because on the one hand, a lot of times the trouble we get into, you know, if you think about, you know, body and soul, you may be making them to adversaries and say, you know, a lot of the trouble we get into is maybe more physical uh, desires or pleasures or whatever is going on in the body. But the reality is that if you think about this lofty soul that wants to do good, wants to do, wants to do uh, mitzvot and wants to serve Hashem, the soul can't do anything with that body. The soul can't write a check to Zaka. The soul can't go to Shul. The soul doesn't even have parents to honor except for the fact that the soul has a heart for the body and the body has parents. Right? So like all of the mitzvahs we do, the soul couldn't do them on, on its own. So the soul needs the body. So the body is full of partners. The partner is in life. The body has on. The soul is not just going to discard its soul's partner just because it's not helpful anymore. The, right, the soul loves its partner. And the soul feels right for the, uh, for the body. And it's very aware of what's going on. Good. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, okay, so a different, different idea. idea. There's, There's a fascinating, I only saw it recently, um, but it's just absolutely fascinating. Song of Songs is a, is described, if you read it, right, if you read a bad translation of it, so then it sounds like a, uh, right, it's a love poem that you want to let your kids read, right? Okay, if you, if you, uh, our sages teach us that it's really, the whole thing is just a, uh, it's a parable. It's an allegory to the different, so, on a basic, basic level, is uh, the, the Jewish people are sort of the wayward wife, and God is a faithful husband.
Bernal Beam, uh, the commentary uh, has a, a whole understanding that really it's, it's six different songs, not broken really down in a chapter, but you know, in sequential order, there are six different times where the allegory changes. And starting right around the beginning of chapter six, I believe, is he understands it to be the body and soul, but the soul leaving the body, not the body and soul, the soul leaving the body. So there's a point where the soul, according to Malvin, is referred to as Mechol's Matanayim, it's dancing two camps. And what that means is, sort of like old Yiddish expression, but I think they dance two ways, right? So what it means is basically there's a whole lot going on, which we're not going to get into, we do a whole class just on the Malvin, but basically there's one verse in chapter 7 where the soul says to the body, I need, this is right at the time of leaving, right? These two verses right next to each other is the, the time that the soul leaves the body. The soul says to the body, that I am my beloved and he desires me. Where the soul says to the body, I'm moving on, right? I'm not, I'm not part of your world anymore. This is the dancing in two camps idea, right? I'm not part of this camp anymore. I'm now in the lofty heavenly camp. And God desires me. I'm going to my beloved and, and he wants me. And then the soul turns around, sorry about that, um, the soul turns around to Hashem and says, come my beloved, let's go forth to the field, let's lodge in the villages. But the Malbim says that it's not the villages, because earlier the body was compared to the city. Big city with a, uh, um, with a tower, I mean, tower and everything like that. So the way the Malbim understands it is that the soul is saying to Hashem, not that we're going to lodge in the villages, but we're just going to lodge in the outskirts of the city. The soul says to the body, I'm leaving you. I'm going to Hashem. The soul turns to Hashem and says, come, let's go, but let's stay on the outskirts overnight. Let's not leave so quickly. I can't just leave the body. So the body, the soul says, I'm leaving, and I'm going to Hashem. And to Hashem, the soul says, I can't leave the body. The soul is in this tug of war. The people who are going to comfort the soul, the people who are going to take care of the body, is a chavadish. When we are in the power room, when we are doing shmir, when we are at the funeral, when we are doing an actual burial, we, all of us, we are the ones who are a comfort to the soul. We are the ones who are allowing the soul to peacefully go on this journey, to join Hashem and say, come my beloved, let's go into the field. And, 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 and we are the ones who are offering that comfort. Lesson two is that the, uh, the soul is aware. So therefore, when we speak in terms of the Tzalma Elohim, it's not just there's an idea of a mitzvah ben Odom Lamakum. That means a mitzvah between man and, and God. So like if you think about like a mezuzah, a mezuzah, you know, there's a mitzvah between man and God. It's man serving God. But then there's also an idea of a, uh, of a, uh, of a mitzvah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, okay, then there's an idea of chesed, of a mitzvah in Adam Lechavero, a mitzvah between man and his fellow, giving charity, helping people out, honoring our parents, etc. And so really when we, with everything that we do with Jewish burial, we're really doing both. We're honoring Hashem, as we mentioned, and, um, but we're also doing the chesed for somebody who really does appreciate what we're doing, even though they can't explain that, and they can't communicate that, and they're not gonna thank you for it. Um, Okay. Right. Okay. This is probably too many questions. So I have no problem. I do. I also do very well with tangents, by the way. Yes.
So the one doing the noticing and the appreciating is the soul. Right, that's the idea. Um, right, good. Okay, so we're going to pose the question here. Is this a necessity when we speak in terms of Kavaganisha's work? Is it a necessity or is it a privilege? In other words, we need to say that if you are about to let you know the solicitation at the end over here is to you know, have everybody help. Uh, but, uh, but before we do that, do we need people to create a congregation in Southwest Florida because, listen, we need people because we need, we need you, right? Or is it, look, this is a real opportunity. It's an opportunity for you. Join. So we're going to pose that question here. Should we take a poll beforehand? Who says it's a necessity? I say both. Oh, both. Unbelievable. Okay. How'd you know? Did you? You cheated. Okay. So, uh, okay, so the necessity goes like this. Rav Yehuda, this is in the Talmud. I'm probably actually going to just do the English. This is in the Talmud in the tractate Moe Cotton, which, which is primarily actually about um, Chola Moe, you know, just the laws of the intermediate days of, of Passover and Sukkot. There's a point where it touches on, on, a, on a person who finds himself mourning during Chola Moe, and then that becomes the... the opportunity to discuss uh, the laws of mourning. So there's a lot of laws of mourning, um, ironically, that are in the tractate discussing, you know, the abnormality of, uh, of mourning. But okay, Rav Yehuda says, in the name of Rav, if a person dies in the city, no one in the city may do work. Okay, everyone is responsible to make sure that that person has a proper burial. That means that you're on the, on the clock, right? So I don't know exactly how you work it out with the boss, and if the boss don't need to pay you or they don't, but everybody needs to make sure that this person, they need to wrap everything to make sure that the person has a proper burial. There was one time that Rab Hamnuna was in a city and he heard that somebody died. And he saw people continuing in their daily work. And he said these people should be cursed. Right? There, there's somebody, there was a, there's been a death in the city. And so they told him there's a Kedisha in the city. So he said, oh, Kedisha. Okay? So now everybody can go ahead and continue their work. In other words, the person is being taken care of. If you have a Chavar in the city, the person is being taken care of by the Chavar Kedisha, everybody else can go ahead and do their work. If there's no Chavar Kedisha in the city, so then every individual is responsible to make sure that that person is, uh, is buried. Okay, that's your necessity. Privilege. Love this one. Is that necessity or required? What's the difference? See, if you think about it, it's not, if you, if you just to think about it going back to the way beginning when we speak in terms of there's a mitzvah of burying a person, right? So who, who's responsible for that mitzvah? If you tell me there's a boy born and there's a mitzvah to give him a bris, you would easily say that it's the father's responsibility, it's the mother's responsibility, and then you have an issue with, God forbid, you know, the, the, the parents both died before the eighth day, so then whose responsibility is it? So then it becomes a community phase in it, right? Then you can, with this, Whose responsibility is it to make sure that the person is buried? Well, it's everybody's responsibility to make sure the person is buried. So the truth is that everybody needs to sort of grab everything and make sure that the person has a proper burial. Now, there's an efficiency in saying that the government needs to go take care of it. This way everybody else can, you know, can go ahead and work. But then if we're talking about, well, okay, well, where's the government needs So, okay, I guess we're the government needs yeah. So, um, okay. But lest one say, um, lest one say that there's, you know, that it's, it's, you know, I go here. You know, like, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it. Because, because it needs to get on. So, you know, so we'll be the ones. But okay. So, in chapter 2 of the book of Ruth, verse 20. So, this is, um, the context of this is that Ruth had just met Boaz. And he helped her out tremendously. They were, they were Ruth and Naomi came from Moab, which I assume is modern day Jordan. And they were basically penniless. And she was, um, and, and she was collecting uh, wheat on his field, and he went, you know, above and beyond what he had to do to help her. So she comes back and tells her mother-in-law Naomi what what happened, and Naomi, and, and tells her that it was uh, was Boaz also, which was a big deal. So he, she says, uh, Naomi says to her, "Blessed is he the Hashem, the Boaz, for he hasn't withheld kindness from the living nor from the dead." Sorry, right? In other words, he's abundantly kind, not only to the living, but to the dead. 
they have to do with the dead people? Where did that come in? What's she referring to? So Rashi says um, that he he sustained the living and he involved himself in the needs of the dead. Okay? Now, Boaz, Boaz, our sages teach us, went by another name, which was Ivtsan. And he was one of the judges. He was one of the Shoftim. Uh, he was a little bit before uh, Samson in the line of things. So he was celebrity status. He was a tremendous Torah scholar. He was the leader of the Jewish people. Right? He was, he was a grand rabbi. He was a rabbi. Right? At the time. And he was in the Taharu. And he was so many Tachrichim. And in fact, it even says that he brought them to Moab. He brought the shrouds to Moab when he heard that Naomi's husband died. Okay? Right? So he was involved in covering the Nisha work. So it's not that it's sort of like, listen, you know, you get the people to do it so they can do it. But rather, and this has always been the tradition, that, that the, the, the people in the community, the, the greatest of the rabbis, the, the greatest of the women in the community have been involved in the Chavar work going back some, I guess, 2,500 years off the top of my head at least. Um, somebody else can do the math later. But, uh, but, but for a very long time that this has been, the, uh, this has been the, the way that it's done. And the reason, again, if you think about it in the context of everything that we're saying, we're not disposing of the dead. If you're just disposing of the dead, then you end up with terms like, you know, the graveyard shift, right? But if you're, but if what you're doing is that it's a comfort for the soul, if it's an honor to the to Hashem, it's an honor to the image of God, so then the truth is that the more a person is attuned to that, the more likely they are to, you know, to, to jump in and, and want to be involved. So it's a chiyuv, and it's a privilege. Okay, custom made this my thing. Okay, the actual uh, the actual custom. We're going to do a. This is a very brief overview of what we actually do, and the idea would be you know when we're when we're actually ready to you know to get organized. So then we're going to do you know real training. We're going to have a dummy. We're going to go through the you know step by step process, and uh, it's going to be much more um, uh, detailed. Okay. All of the customs that we have stem from one of three beliefs. There's a possible fourth. Um, this is my one of these just unbelievable situations. This graphic of faith, hope, and love. You ready for this? Okay. So one is the recently deceased is about to experience their ultimate Yom Kippur, their final judgment day. And, and there's a lot that we do, which is basically preparing them, so to speak, for the judgment day. We do as a, just a basic tenet of the Jewish faith. We believe in uh, reward and punishment. We believe that Hashem knows our deeds. Hashem even knows our intentions in doing those deeds. And that, that after we pass on, that we're judged for, for what we've done. So the shrouds, and the shrouds, by the way, are the same for men and women. Very minor difference with the headpiece. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, they're the same modeled after the white garments of the high priest on Yom Kippur, the garments that he would wear to go into the Holy of Holies for that one day of, year, of the year that he did it, that's the way that every Jewish person is buried because they are about to approach the Holy of Holies, right? And they are about to be judged on Yom Kippur. And as far as each one of us is concerned, we're our own high priest. So, uh, and, and the preparations beforehand, the washing, the mikvah, everything is all modeled after that. The other idea is that the soul is aware of what's happening to the body and still has an affinity and a sense of belonging to the body. So there are many things that we do which are simply a comfort to the soul. And in fact, even the eulogy, which when we think in terms of a eulogy, you know, you would say, well, it's, a, it's closure for the family, it's closure for the friends, it's inspiration. No, that's true. Well, that's definitely true. But the eulogy is also brought down that the eulogy is a comfort to the soul. Because the truth is that now that the soul, which is aware of what's going on, can take comfort in realizing that he or she did inspire other people, and that they are leaving a legacy. Um, and then finally, which is uh, the, the soul, and the body and soul will be reunited with Tachiyah Samesim, which is the resurrection of the dead. So resurrection is its own very long topic we can talk about. But, um, but the point is that there are certain things that we do that, um, that show 
our belief uh, in, the, uh, in the resurrection. Resurrection is one of these funny words, by the way. I have this class that I like to give called the top 10 Jewish terms that are corrupted and co-opted. So I claim that resurrection is one of these terms that, I, that like, if you read some Jewish writing, for some reason we shy away from the term, term resurrection. So people use resuscitation, but resuscitation is what the, what the first responders do, right? You know? so, uh, so we don't use the word resurrection, and then it kind of gets out there that it's like, like, no, that's a Christian concept, we don't believe in that. It's like, no, 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 we believe in that. Use the term, resurrection. Okay, anyway, um, an important tangent, a very, very important tangent, is that the way that we treat the, our dead is an expression of all 13 principles of our faith. Rambam counts 13 principles of faith. We could go through it. It would be its own class. That's why it's a tangent. But, um, but in the context of the, of, of the basic tenets of Judaism, First, everything we do is based on that, and in that context, there's really no alternative than to do what it is that we do. That's my tangent. Okay, that was a little commercial. Okay, so uh, Shmira. Shmira is immediately from the time that the person dies. Shmira literally means guarding, uh, although maybe more appropriately is a visual. On a practical level, it's to make sure that the body is safe, that it's away from, you know, from animals or bugs or whatever. It's uh, a way of making sure the bodies don't get confused which sounds like a horrible thing, but trust me, it happens. Um, and, uh, and, and that's on one practical sense. A different sense is that the Shomer, that's the person doing Shmira, acts as a comfort to the soul, right? which is in a state of confusion. So there's a comfort in just knowing that there's another Jewish person around. There's another idea, which I apologize for not mentioning, on a selfish level, but this is actually brought down in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Code of Jewish Law, that there's a verse in Tehillim, in Psalms, chapter 49, which is what we say in the house of mourning after, after we dive in. Yechi od l'netzach. He'll live eternally, not actually live eternally, but he'll have an eternal life. Lo uh, yireh He won't see his own destruction. Why? Ki yireh, because he saw chachomim yamusu. That wise men die. Uh, Yachad, Kisil, Uvari, Yobedu, the intelligent person and the fool. They both die. They die the same way. And they leave their riches to other people. A person can attain eternal, can achieve eternal life. A person can be inspired to live life righteously, realizing something that we all know, but we don't necessarily realize it, realizing that everybody dies. And realizing that the wise men die, and the fools die, and that everybody dies. So the idea is that on a selfish level, and this again, this is brought down as the reason for this in the Shulchan Aruch, right? On a selfish level, the Shomer himself or herself can be inspired to live a righteous life by the fact that they're confronting death. Okay, moving on, Tahara. Tahara process, touched on this a little bit, but one is the... Um, Oh yeah, this is an important thing. The Medrash tells us that a person appears before Hashem. I have no idea what exactly how you explain this in terms of the physical and the spiritual and how the two work. But to, uh, on some level, the person appears before Hashem the way that they uh, that they are the way that they look in the grave, and so therefore we clean them and therefore we dress them for the you know for the proper occasion as far as the occasion. We kind of mentioned it already about the person Yom Kippur. We're going to do that in the next slide also. Um, very important also is that the same way that a newborn is washed upon entering this world, so too we wash the body as it enters the next world. Okay, and in fact, and that is an expression that, uh, of our faith that there is a next world. Born theme, the theme of the newborn is going to be a, uh, a, a, we're going to get to it in a moment also. Okay, I kind of gave it to you. Uh, shrouds, takritim. So it's a preparing, preparation rather for judgment day. So at this point, also, the way that the shrouds are, are, are made is phenomenal. That there's no, there are no pockets. Um, there are no uh, 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 hems, right? Uh, I mean, the cuffs, right? You know, the, the way that it's hemmed at the edges is just very simple stitching. There's no cuffs because the, the, the cuff itself sort of looks like you can maybe hold something in there. But the idea is you're not taking anything with you. Or you are, but it's nothing that you can put in your pocket. So, uh, so that's the, the idea. The idea that everybody's buried the same. 
And also, like we said before, that the person is dressed the same way is modeled after the garments of the uh, Kohen Gadol. We are careful to keep the Tafrikim clean. We are very, very careful to keep the Tafrikim clean. We'll go to great lengths to keep the Tafrikim clean, and if we don't, we will clean them. If we can't clean them, we'll use a different set. Um, because exactly what people are going to wear when we're all resurrected, I don't know if we're all going to be wearing this, or maybe we'll get different clothing, but at least at first, this is what we're going to be wearing. So, um, so the idea is that we wouldn't prepare somebody for the wonderful event of resurrection in Mashikole. So therefore, by keeping it clean, we're showing that we believe that, uh, you know, that, that there is going to be a, uh, a resurrection. Okay, I kind of put all these together. Um, but that each one of them is worthy of its own slide, but just in, in terms of the actual work of this Chavar Ganesha, we can kind of, you know, move quickly. The casket, the eulogy, and um, the funeral with Levi, the actual escort, and then the actual in-ground burial. So the idea is that the grave is the portal to the next world, the way we look at it. So we escort the deceased as we sort of send them off, as you would send off a loved one. The word kever, which means grave, is also used by the sages to mean womb. Okay, the term, the Shulchan Aruch, right, uses the term kever for womb. And, uh, and the term kever also means grave, and, and it's not a mistake. The idea is that the same way that we can very easily picture the womb as being the portal into this world, from one existence into a very different existence, the grave is also the portal, for lack of a better term, of from one existence to a very different existence. But the idea is that the soul is eternal, and the soul, you know, lives on. Okay. So here we have, this would be Tulsa Um Okay, we are trying to form a professional organization that, um, that will basically do the following. We were going to recruit a network of Mitzaharim and Mitzaharos, that would be people who will do a Zahara. And we will provide training for the procedure, so meaning even if you've never done a Zahara before, you know, and whatnot, it's not as scary as it seems, also in the context of everything that we're talking about, there's very much a difference between seeing it as, you know, like that, and seeing it as for a comfort for the soul, and the soul, you know, very different when the soul is very much in the room. Um, and then also, not necessarily asking everybody to do this, but meaning the leadership of the organization would reach out to local funeral directors and encourage them to promote Zahara. And I'll tell you, when I was in Queens, I did my time in New York. When I was in Queens and I was working for Ferreira Zone, who's the head of the National Association of Chavar Ganesha, he's also the head of the Chavar Ganesha of the Bauer Zone of Queens, every so often we would go to Sad Harbor. Okay? Sad Harbor, if you know where that is, is like Montauk, which is like the easternmost part of the United States, is like 10 miles away from Sad Harbor. And there is this guy, he's the sweetest man in the world, and he was a you know, Gentile man, and he was telling us he lived in this house his whole life. This house is a funeral. He lived in the house the whole life, and he would help his father. He was nine years old before they had a lift, and he would do it. He's telling us all these stories. And oh, you want to see the tree that Billy Joel hooked with his car? It's over there. And he would tell us all these stories, right? So, so he's so he tells us for food before the car. And he said, yeah. He said, family comes in, and they say they want information, and I say, fine, no problem. And uh, and they say and they say we're Jewish. I said, oh. You're Jewish, you need a Tahara ceremony. I'll call Rabbi Zom. So I call Rabbi Zom, and I tell him that it's a uh, Tahara ceremony, but don't worry about the casket because it's a cremation. And Rabbi Zom says that you can't have a cremation, and we're not going to do the Tahara if it's going to be a cremation. So I went back to the family, and I said, you can't have a Tahara if it's a cremation, and you have to have a Tahara because you're Jewish. So there can't be a cremation. <laughs> so the family said, okay, we don't have a cremation, and here we are, we have the Tahara, right? So it's not always that easy, but that's right. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the other thing is also that I, I have heard, there's one time, so what he said, was, what I heard over the phone was the following. But listen, man, I'll, I'll tell you. If your mom gets dressed, you know, in a new dress, and it's going to be one of our professional men doing it, it's going to be, it is what it is, you know, and, and, and that's it. But if she, if she has a tahara, so then you have a, a nice group of religious Jewish ladies, and they're going to, you know, they're going to dress her, you know, in traditional uh, shrouds, and, you know, it's really very beautiful. 
that's not good. Right? It's really that easy. And the idea is that if we if we have a Cyber Kadisha, which is a professional organization where when they come in, when the funeral home comes into their prep room the next morning after we were there, everything's clean, everything's put away, we came on time, we left on time, right? You know, we do things right, we come in, we see, we follow the rules, but we do things according to our traditions and you know and whatnot. And the leadership of the organization has, you know, a professional rapport with them. It's not that difficult. And the truth of the matter is that there's that money is the only factor in the funeral home industry, right? We're not going to floor ourselves here. But the reality is that there are ways to do it where the Sahara doesn't cost the funeral home anything, where, um, where they can even make a little bit of money on the Sahara without gouging the family. And, you know, there are ways to control that. And there are ways that we really could get them. And, and it's a funny thing, and I hate to say it, but there are some times where the non-Jewish funeral homes, where the non-Jewish funeral directors, who just don't have any, you know, personal investment in whether or not the person does a Tahara or not, are more than happy to say, oh, you're Jewish, would you like Tahara? What's a Tahara? Oh, well, here's the booklet. Right? Here's the video. Here's whatever. Right? We'll give them all types of, you know, uh, materials on it. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, let's do it. Right? And, um, and, and we can really, just by, by existing, by, you know, by being there, by reaching out to the funeral, the funeral homes, we really have an opportunity where it's not just a matter of when we get a call, we can take care of it, but it's a matter of that there will be more calls, um, and everything we, we we do many things in the Sahara in order to show that we don't really want to do what we're doing, and we hope we don't do it again, and we hope that Mashiach comes, and we hope that that, you know, that Hashem removes death from the world. The reality is, the reality is that to have to have the gospel speaking the past tense. Um, that in situations where you have community Shabbos Kedisha that don't do a Tahara for weeks at a time, it's not because the angel of death was on vacation. Um, it's because the funeral homes were not pushing it. Right? And, and the reality is that until Mashiach comes, we, we, not that we want the business, but we want the business, which is a hard thing to say, but you understand what I'm saying, right? In other words, not that we want the business, but we want to be able to do the mitzvah when the situation arises. If the situation would not arise, we'd be more than happy. When Mashiach comes, all the Kavar Kedishas will be the happiest people to find a different facet to do. Yes? And you will be doing, creating this statewide, or are you doing this also nationally? Well, we have, well, I mean, there are many cities and communities have Kavar Kedisha already set up. Some of them well-established, 100-year-old Kavar Kedisha. What we're talking about right here is, they, is to create a new Kavar Kedisha of Southwest Florida, which would hopefully have a very large imprint, uh, footprint, sorry, a very large footprint, you know, from all, all over Southwest Florida, where there are Jewish communities, and, um, I, and, and and that's the idea. Yes? Could you briefly, briefly discuss the reasons why you would not invite Shuba to the bar? You just mentioned it. I saw you that it's going to be a uh, coronation. Yeah, that's the only, the, I mean, okay, this is kind of where you have your NASC standards. Okay, so... <laughs> So the, the next standard, I guess, would be if the person's having a cremate, if the person is going to be cremated, so then that's where we would take a, a, a hard-nosed approach and say that we can't be part of that. And we're happy to talk to the family about the disadvantages of cremation. We're happy to spend all the time, whatever it takes, however long it takes, um, right, you know, to, uh, to talk them out of it. But the reality is that if they're going through with it and that's going to happen, then... Um, then, then the reality is that we and would basically protest. Reason, what is the halakhic reason that you can explain that would prevent someone who had been being cremated to have a kahaki? Okay, so good question. So the, the answer is that it's one of these situations where if we, if we would participate in it, it would be like, a, uh, like an approbation of what's going on. Like, like we're sort of giving our stamp of approval. Right, so we just we just can't do that. So there's a point where it's 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 so bad, it's such a bad choice that we can't be part of that. And it's a little bit hard to understand because you definitely you could easily make the case so on the individual level, this individual, right, this individual should have a tahara. But the reality is that if Chavros Kedisha throughout America would do Zaharas in situations where there are cremations, even though cremations, unfortunately, 
you know, the, the rate of formation is skyrocketing, but it would be much worse. I hope you see this as a tremendous opportunity to help out not only the individual Jewish people who will benefit from the service, but also to see this as an opportunity to be part of something really special and to be an important part and an important institution in the Southwest Florida Jewish community. In closing, I just want to mention that there's a verse in Ecclesiastes and Kohelis that really encapsulates a lot of what we're talking about. The verse says, that the, the, the earth, the dirt, the, but the body returns to the earth as it were. And the spirit, the soul, returns to God who gave it. And this is very much in line with what we've been talking about, where the, the soul is very concerned about the welfare of the body. The soul wants the body to be treated respectfully. And with the beautiful work of the Chavar Kedisha, what we're able to do is to care for the body according to Jewish tradition and according to Jewish custom and Jewish law, and eventually to bury the body according to Jewish custom and Jewish law. And in so doing, by us ensuring that the body is in fact at peace, then the soul is truly at peace. And we are able to give the very keenly aware, very sensitive, eternal soul of this person, eternal peace and the ability to return to God and to go on their journey because we took such great care of the body. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'd like to again thank Chabad of Fort Myers and uh, the uh, Ishmuli and Malko Forchner for putting this together. If you are interested in Finding out more about Chavar Kedisha, you can visit nask.org, that's N-A-S-C-K.org. You can feel free to reach out to me directly at 561-376-9972 or Rabbi Lyons, that's R-A-B-B-I-L-Y-O-N-S, at nask.org, N-A-S-C-K.org. And please speak to Malcolm Shmuley Forchner about joining the Chavar Kedisha. We will hopefully have another presentation perhaps in Naples uh, shortly, and then to have a major training all-day seminar uh, one Sunday in February. Hoping you enjoyed and gained from this program, and Yashar Koyach to everyone involved for starting what I believe will be a tremendous asset to the Florida Jewish community.